From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jimmy Sayer, at Inter Allied Life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Jim. How are you? The way I feel now, the way I'm going to feel depends on you. Okay, let's have it. Remember a guy named King Tut? Egyptian mummy they dug out of a tomb full of treasure a few years ago. That's right. Well, don't tell me you held a policy on him, Jim. <laughs> Seriously, now. You'll also remember there was supposed to be a curse on anybody who molested his tomb. Yeah, supposed to be. But, of course, anybody knows that stuff's a lot of marking. Is it? Isn't it? Better reserve judgment, Johnny. Until you hear about the curse of Kamashek. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Interallied Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account item one, one dollar even. Taxi to the office of Interallied Life to talk with Jim Sayer. The conference was brief and not very enlightening. I'd much rather have you see Mr. Turnbull and get the story from him yourself. As I said in the beginning, he's a very important client. What's more to the point, he can tell you about it much better than I can. Jim, to coin a cliche, you're being just as clear as mud. Also, by the way, he specifically asked for you. Oh, how come? Well, it seems he liked the way you handled the Parkinson case a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, Emily Parkinson, the widow who died. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. She was his sister. And, well, go down and see him, Johnny. I, I honestly can't tell you anything more than I already have about the thing. James, you have told me nothing. But he can. And you can pick up a nice fee on it. As a favor to me. No. Nope. For that nice fee. Jim promised to phone Eric Turnbull and I was on my way and I ran of items two and three, four dollars and twenty cents for a quick lunch and train fare to Stanford. There I was met by a chauffeured car and driven to Turnbull's house. Far out of the town on Birchbrook Road, it was set on one of the biggest, most beautifully landscaped pieces of property I'd ever seen. The fine old home looked as though it had stood there in all its straight-laced dignity for a hundred years and stolid against the changing world would stand for another hundred. In sharp contrast, a lithe, clean Studebaker Golden Hawk was parked in the sweeping driveway at the front. Haskins, the chauffeur, had explained on the way that he doubled his butler, so I wasn't particularly surprised when he opened the door for me. Since you received the call about your coming, sir, you are to go right in while I take the motor car to the garage. Unless... He glanced at the Golden Hawk quickly back of me, then, having left the word unless hanging in midair, climbed back behind the wheel and drove off. Well, he said go right in. Inside, the house was a classic. From the tile floored reception room with its walls of oak, the broad staircase leading to the second floor. I could look into the huge living room, finished in polished mahogany, with a leaded glass window at one side and thick oriental rugs on the floor. A fireplace that seemed to take in a whole wall, and fine mahogany furniture that glowed with a beautiful patina. Beyond that, I could see the library, golden and walnut. And sitting at a broad desk was a man, his face red with anger, shaking his fist at a very attractive girl of 22 or 3 who stood before him, obviously distressed by what was going on. Call me Uncle Eric. I'm not your uncle now, and by heaven, if I have my way, I never will be. <clears throat> You're not married to him yet, my girl, and if I have anything to say about it, you... Oh. Oh. Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes, sir. Mr. Turnbull? Well, that's right. Come in, come in. And Dorothy, Mr. Dollar and I wish to be alone. The girl stood there for a brief moment, looking at the man with an expression of utter futility in her face. Then, without so much as a glance at me, he turned and left by the door that I had just entered. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. Somewhat embarrassing to you, I'm sure. But it's... Well, it's something I'll have to tell you about later. Sit down, please. Thanks. May I pour you a drink? I must confess, I feel I could use one at the moment. No, no thanks, Mr. Turnbull. I uh, think I'll pass it. I suppose it is a little early, but... Well, good luck. Now... 
Jim Sayer, an inner ally, tells me you have an insurance problem. Actually, not yet. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Dollar. Please do. I'm asking you to help me not as an insurance investigator, but as a man I feel I can trust. <laughs> but you don't really know me, Mr. Turnbull. Oh, on the contrary, I do very well. As a result of your handling of the case of my widowed sister, Emily, when she died a few years ago. As a matter of fact, you and I met very briefly at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, Emily Parkinson. The case involved a lot of phony relatives who filed claims on her estate. Yes, that's right. And your clever trapping of those false claimants and that cheap attempts to gain part of Emily's fortune was... Mm, I understand that several of them are still serving sentences. Yeah, I believe so. Which is quite what they deserve. If there's anything I detest in this world, it's dishonesty. Well, I, uh, I guess most of us feel that way about it. Of course we do, if we have any shred of human dignity. Yeah. But now, uh, what is your problem? It uh, concerns Donald, uh, Emily's son, my nephew. I had expected him to arrive here before you, but suppose I go ahead anyway. Go ahead. Well, when her husband died, Emily was left with a considerable estate and their only child, Donald. The uh, estate's worth nearly a million now. Mm -hmm. With not too many years ahead of us, she wasn't well. She had lavished everything on the boy, the best of private schools, traveled to Europe, all the things that befit one of our social and financial status. Before she died, she carefully put all of the money into a trust for Donald. A rather unique arrangement, which I control until he reaches the age of 30. What would happen if he didn't survive you? Would it all pass to you? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But of course, I have no particular need of it. When I sold Turnbull Enterprises some years ago, I, I think you can see that I'm pretty well fixed investments, you know. Yeah. At uh, any rate, since his mother died, Donald has been living here with me in accordance with her request that I care for him. And I've been glad to do it. I love the boy very dearly. How old is he, by the way? Uh, Twenty-five. He'll be twenty-six in October. And what's he doing for a living? Now, uh, that's the whole point. There's no need for him to work for a living, as you put it. But in college, against my better judgment, he majored in archaeology and Egyptology. Mm. What did you want him to study? <laughs> Business and finance, of course. Forgive me for being so blunt, Dollar, but I see no sense whatsoever in his taking the fortune that his father spent so many years building up and squandering it on a lot of... of... Oh, oh, Donald, come in, come in. I received word at the club you wish to see me, Uncle Larry. What is it, this... Oh. Mr. Dollar is my nephew, Donald Cronin. Hi, Donald. We've been talking about you, Donald. Oh? As a result of a newspaper item I just read, the effect that you're preparing for another expedition. That's right, sir. I'm going to the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt. Egypt? Since my trip last fall, I've done a lot of reading and research in New York and London. I'm convinced I've located the ancient tomb of the pharaoh Kamashek. The advance party's already begun excavation. I'll join them there. Do you realize the cost of this, this thing? Uncle Eric, it promises to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. You mean it might be if I let you go? If? Let me go. Uncle Eric, perhaps Mr. Dollar... Mr. Dollar can hear anything I have to say to you. You see, Dollar, we're finally getting to the point. Uh, yeah. Donald, I'll make no bones about it. I'm quite fed up with your wasting your time on these stupid, pointless expeditions. That's not the way the museum feels about them, sir. Well, that's the way I feel about them. Oh, wait, sir, please. Uh, Donald, isn't that your collection for Yucatan that the museum recently acquired? Why, yes, sir. My party and I were able to... I'm sure we don't care about your party and you. You're not only wasting your time, but your money. The money your father struggled an entire lifetime to gain. That money was left for me to spend in any way I see fit. Provided your handling of it meets my approval. When you're 30 and the estate passes completely into your hands, you can do anything you like with it. Buy the Brooklyn Bridge if you want. You probably will. But until then, I am legally in control of it. And now, finally, I have every intention of exercising that control. At least to the extent of seeing you don't squander any more of it on these foolhardy expeditions. I take it you've made several, Donald. Yes, sir, and he's opposed me in all of them. Because sooner or later you've got to learn that as the wealthy son of a family, it's up to you to carry on the tradition that's been set for you. To increase the fortune that's part of your family name, build even greater financial power, not to throw it away. Do you call my contributions to science and history a waste of money? Oh, now look. There's nothing selfish about my attitude in this matter. I'm thinking only of you and your future. The family name, if you alone, are left to uphold. Well. Why don't you give up this asinine idea of going to Egypt? No, sir. What do you mean, no? Let me finish. There's no point in your saying any more, Uncle. I'm going to explore the tomb of Kamashek. Now listen here, you I've young made great... all the arrangements, obtained the sponsorship of the museum, notified the universities that are interested in my work. I say you're not going. And I say I am, sir. You. Don't you realize that I'm in a position to cut you off without a penny? 
If you think I care, Uncle Eric, you're crazy. Then by heaven, I will. So help me, Donald. I've tried to avoid this kind of situation, but you and your idiotic bullheadedness, your utter disregard for the responsibility and importance of your family, social status have made it inevitable. Now it's come in spite of all I've tried to do, and by heaven, I'll cut you off without a... Wait a minute. Donald, where are you going? Egypt. In the moment or two before Eric Turnbull recovered his poise enough to speak to me, my mind raced. This whole situation offered a big flock of wild possibilities. Obviously, the two were at sword points, had been for some time. Apparently, and I began to wonder about this, Turnbull had no need of Donald's money. Yet he seemed determined to keep him from spending it. And on what looked to me like a very worthy expedition. If Donald died, Turnbull had said, the estate would pass to him. Oh, and something else I wanted to find out about the girl who'd been there when I arrived. But why? Why? Oh... Why did I want to know or need any answers? What could this whole affair possibly have meant to me? I'm no family counselor. I'm an... In- I guess I spoke that thought out loud. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes, Dollar. Which is another reason why I need your help in this affair. But I, uh, I just don't see it, Mr. I'm Turnbull. I'm afraid I must apologize for that little scene a moment ago. Oh, well, there's no need to. It was interesting, to say the least. Well, we didn't touch on the one thing that I wanted you to know about. That girl, Dorothy Harkness, his so-called fiancé... <laughs> Oh. Thanks to a generous allowance, plus fees from the museum and some of the universities, Donald's insured his life for $100,000. 50000 for the museum, and a like amount for the girl. Through inner allied Yes. I'll put it to you bluntly. She has prodded him to go on these expeditions, and I believe she somehow hopes to engineer his death during this Kamashek project in order to collect on that policy. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> If anything was clear about this situation, I certainly couldn't see it. More things had come flying at me from out of left field during the past half hour than I could cope with. And I wanted time to organize some kind of thinking. So I used a corny old device, glanced at my watch, said something about being late for an appointment back in Hartford. I apologized, promised to talk with him again tomorrow when there'd be more time. Haskins drove me back to the station and courteously waited until the train pulled in, then left. And it was then I noticed the little Sudabaker Golden Hawk that I'd seen at the house pull up beside the platform, and the girl, Dorothy Harkness, jumped out and ran over to me. Mr. Dollar, I had to wait for Haskins to leave so he wouldn't see me. Oh? I must talk to you. Please call me. Here's the number. Is this about Donald? Yes. Because of the danger he's in. For Mr. Turnbull? No. And you must believe me. From the curse of Kamashek. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a little order starts to come out of the Department of Utter Confusion and a promise of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your call to Stanford, sir. Oh, thank you, operator. Hello? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you called. Well, you seem pretty anxious to talk about something, Miss Harkness. I am, about Donald. 
Donald and his uncle. And Donald's plan for the expedition to Egypt. To dig up the remains of the old Pharaoh Kamashek? Yes. Can you come over here to see me, please? When I talked to you on the station platform a while ago, you said something about the curse of Kamashek. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Isn't that nothing more nor less than superstition? No. Huh? I'm afraid that in this case, Mr. Dollar, it can mean nothing more nor less than murder. I'll take the first train. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut... Assignment, The Curse of Kamashek Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 4, 320, cab to the station, train fare from Hartford to Stamford, and cab to the modest but attractive apartment of Dorothy Harkness. The short trip gave me time to think. Eric Turnbull, wealthy retired businessman, called me in on this case. Turnbull, uncle of young Donald Cronin, entirely in control of a large trust fund for the boy. Turnbull, who was determined to prevent him from making an expedition to the tomb of Kamashek, on the excuse that he suspected a plot against the boy's life, engineered by Dorothy Harkness, who was not only Donald's fiancée, but a beneficiary of his $100,000 life policy. So a talk with Dorothy Harkness seemed very much in order. Oh, come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm so glad you were willing to come and talk with me. How are you, Miss Harkness? You make me sound so old. Dorothy, won't you sit down? All right. Thank you. But before we go any further, Dorothy, I think you ought to understand that I'm an insurance investigator, and so oh, far... I know that. Donald told me his uncle was going to send for you. But there's been no claim file, no reason for one. I know. Mr. Turnbull does, well, kind of unusual things now and then, and I guess this is one of them. Unless he's trying to prevent whatever might cause a claim to be filed. Mr. Dollar, I don't know what Mr. Turnbull has told you about me, but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm afraid we don't get along very well. Well, it's uh, pretty obvious he doesn't like your interest in his nephew, Donald. I've known Donald since school, Mr. Dollar, and we, we hope to get married. At least Donald does. Oh? And what about you? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I got the impression from Mr. Turnbull you were doing a pretty good job of getting Donald into your clutches. Not the way it is at all. We've been seeing a great deal of each other, and Donald has asked me to marry him. And I'm fond of him, Mr. Dollar, terribly fond of him. But so far as marriage is concerned, I... I'm not sure. What do you mean? I can't help wondering all the time if he isn't hoping to marry me just as, a, as an escape from his uncle. Uh-huh. Would you marry him? If I was sure. If, if you know. You'd be sure of an awful lot of money, Dorothy. What? The minute he reached 30, that is. Mr. Turnbull has poisoned your mind, Mr. Dollar. What money Donald has or may have has nothing to do with it. That sort of thinking is filthy. I, um, I guess you mean that, don't you? Yes. I think I've loved Donald ever since my father brought him into the museum. Your father? Yes, he's curator of archaeology. Well, how does he feel about Donald and you? His only interest in Donald is in the money, the financial support he gives the museum. Since mother died, he's become a grasping, self-centered old man whose only interest is in the museum. I see. I don't live with him anymore. Well, then I take it he opposes any thought of your marrying Don. You want me to string him along, raise money and scientific contributions. But Donald is making something of himself. Instead of wasting his life in idle luxury, as Mr. Turnbull would have it. Or would he rather have Don increase the family fortune? No. No, just not spend it. That's all he cares about. So if anything should happen to Donald, there would be more left for Miss Eric Turnbull. And that's why I called you. But I'm afraid that if Donald does go on this expedition to Egypt, something will happen to him. Oh, now, wait a minute. Turnbull has objected strenuously to this latest expedition. You don't know that. Either of them. They're of the same stock, and they're both stubborn, determined, and willful. And his uncle is clever. Clever enough to play on this stubbornness. Capitalize on it. What's that supposed to be? He knows that the surest way to keep Donald from doing something is to insist that he do it. It's always been that way. Are you sure you haven't been reading too much psychology? It's true. 
And in spite of Donald's academic maturity, he's almost like a child in some things. Emotional sometimes. But that's another reason why I wonder if Donald really wants to marry me. If he loves me enough. Or if he's simply rebelling against his uncle. Do you feel, then, that Mr. Turnbull is opposing the expedition to be sure that Donald will make it? Yes. Because he doesn't quietly reason with Donald, talk things out. He shouts, he storms, he threatens. And that gets Don's back hair up. Yeah. Makes him more determined to go than ever. Wouldn't it do the same to you? <laughs> Maybe so. I'm afraid that if he does go, he'll never come back. You honestly don't want him to go? No. Just what you think might happen to him. This curse of Kamashek you mentioned? I think that would be the excuse for his uncle to have something happen to him. What is this curse? Do you remember King Tutankhamun? Well, I remember hearing and reading something about him, old Egyptian pharaoh. His tomb had a curse on it, too. But because they believed it would yield important historical data and some of the treasure of those ancient dynasties, an expedition went to the Valley of the Kings and excavated it anyhow. You're really happy on this stuff, aren't you? Donald's interest in it, I guess, but... Listen to me. One after another, people who were involved in that expedition died under very mysterious circumstances. Yeah, I remember. Even Lord Carnivan himself. They said that he died from the results of a mosquito bite and pneumonia. But the other deaths were not so easily explained away. Not even by able scientists and doctors. You believe in the curse of King Tut, then? And now the curse of Kamashek? No. Well, I don't. But from what you just told me... There have been too many other tombs, all bearing warnings, where the people who dug into them touched the treasures in them, even touched the remains of the kings, had no harm at all come to them. Well, then I'm afraid I don't see what you're driving at. This, Johnny. Any mysterious death of someone who's explored one of these ancient tombs will be accepted as a result of the curse, don't you see? It's an open door to murder. You know something, to me it all sounds a little far-fetched. No. Because of Eric Turnbull. Because I'm sure he wants Donald out of the way. For his money? This terrible friction between them, this antagonism that's been building up for years. And it's reached a point where either one of them would be glad to see the other out of the way. But Eric Turnbull is the only one who is evil enough to do something about it. Well, i got to admit the sparks kind of flew between them when I saw them together. And don't forget it would be to his uncle's advantage if Donald were to die. He needs the money? Well, no, I guess he doesn't. Well, what about you? I'm doing all right at the museum. Earning enough to live on, and I'm happy now. Just the same as I understand it, you'd collect half of Donald's life policy. I hate you for even thinking about such a thing. I hoped you would help me save Donald's life. Funny, though, isn't it? Funny. Harry Turnbull is my employer in this case, if there really is a case. Because he's smart. He's clever. He's clever enough to know that calling you in would help cover up anything he might do. All right, look. Suppose Eric Turnbull did want, did plan to get rid of Donald. How? I don't know. But this I do know. It's the thing that has scared me. On his last expedition, and he didn't realize it until afterwards, one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to have been paid separately by Mr. Turnbull. Why not? He probably wanted somebody there to look after Donald without his knowing. Listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents that could have cost Donald his life. Oh, no, Dorothy, look. No, please. no. No, I can see that you don't believe anything I've told you. Dorothy, I think you're just building up something in your imagination. You don't doesn't... believe me. But at least do this. Remember, no matter what happens, remember what I've told you. Somebody was lying. That was a cinch. But who? And why? Unless one of them really was plotting against the life of Donald Croman. I couldn't get it out of my head that at least Eric Turnbull didn't need whatever money would come from Donald's death. Dorothy Harkness, on the other hand, would gain what to her would be plenty. Sure, nearly a million would go to Turnbull. But that would mean much less to him than the 50,000 insurance would to her. Well, there seemed to be nothing more to say to her at the moment, so I left her, took a cab back to the station, that's item 5, 65 cents, and telephoned to the house on Birchbrook Road in the hope that Donald would be home and I'd have a chance to talk to him. Hello? Oh, Mr. Turnbull, uh, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, splendid. Where are you? Well, I'm at the station, but I was calling to try and... Splendid. Haskins will drive the car down to meet you immediately. Well, uh, now... I knew that if you thought it over, you'd be willing to take on this case. 
Uh, yeah, sure. You just wait right there. Haskins will be along in a few minutes. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you, but before we, uh, before we talk about this... Sit down, thing... won't you? Now, from what I've been able to learn, Donald is planning to leave for Egypt immediately. I, uh, checked with a friend at the Explorers Club in New York where the boy's been staying these past few days. Oh, I thought he always stayed right here with you. Well, he does, except when he's preparing for an expedition. Then you are going to let him go. Well, how can I stop him without making him look foolish in the eyes of his colleagues? The museum, the universities are so interested in his work... Yes, I have to let him go. What would you beside him then? Oh, wait a minute. Of course, I'll expect you to be with him during the entire expedition. Oh, now look, I... Remember this, no expenses to be spared in the protection of my nephew's life. I uh, had to go down to New York to see David Wilt. He's my stockbroker, Harrison Dillman Company. While I was there, I stopped at my bank and arranged to have some 5,000 in American Express Chavez checks ready for you. All you have to do is go down there and sign them, pick them up. If you need more, cable me. You don't waste any time, do you? I know, Donald. He's very stubborn and determined and willful. <laughs> in his present frame of mind, he might pack up and take off at a moment's notice. I want to be sure you're at his side. Okay, you're the boss. But, Mr. Turnbull... Yes? You still haven't told me why you think his life is in any more danger on this expedition than on any of the others he's undertaken. Because that girl, Dorothy Harkness, is smart, is clever... Because of something that happened on Donald's last expedition, Yucatan. Oh? He didn't realize it until afterwards. But one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to be a friend of this Dorothy Hoffman. Not 20 minutes ago, I heard exactly... Now listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents. That could have cost Donald his life. And Mr. Dollar, though lacking any proof, I am convinced he was put up to them by the beneficiary of his insurance policy, Dorothy Harkness. <laughs> Did I say somebody was lying? Somebody had to be lying. And by now, that old feeling was beginning to come back to me. That hunch, whatever it is, that told me somebody was planning to kill Donald. Eric Turnbull? Dorothy Harkness? Who? Something told me I'd better get to Donald Cronin. But fast. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, suddenly the reason for a carefully planned murder becomes crystal clear, and a race against death becomes a race for my own life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is the operator at the Explorers Club. Oh, good. Have you been able Sorry, to... Sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I haven't been able to reach Mr. Donald Cronin for you. Well, hasn't he been there at all? He was in and out all morning, but he refused to answer any calls then. Since you first telephoned, he hasn't been back. Well, do you know when he will be back? No, I don't, sir. All right, then leave a message. I'll meet him there at the club. It's important that I keep him from being murdered. Tonight, 
And every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item six, $9.80, train to New York, quick lunch and taxi to the Traders Bank and Trust Company. There I picked up the American Express traveler's checks that Eric Turnbull had left in my name, had left for expense money to take me to Egypt, to make sure his nephew Donald Cronin lived safely through an expedition to open the grave of the ancient pharaoh Kamashek. The bank teller's brief remark gave me something to think about. Mm. Our, uh, sign, Mr. Dollar? Mm, yep. Yes, now, let me check the amount for you just once more. All right. One thousand, two thousand, three thousand, thirty-five hundred, four, forty-five, seven, eight, at five thousand dollars each. Mm-hmm. Yes, here you are. Good, thanks. And as I'm sure Mr. Turnbull knows, this will close out this particular account completely. I thought about that remark a little later, when it began to tie in with some other things I learned. Right now, item 780 cents cab fare to the Explorers Club. Donald had not yet returned, so I left another message for him, asking him to sit tight until he heard from me. And I meant sit tight. Because apparently, after the latest argument with his Uncle Eric, he was quite likely to hop off to Egypt on short notice. This I didn't want. As a matter of fact, at this point, I wasn't sure I approved of his expedition at all. Both his uncle and his girlfriend, Dorothy Harkness, had told me they thought his life was in danger. And each accused the other of plotting his murder. I was about to leave the Explorers Club when I was buttonholed by a short, kind of cute-looking old character in... Gray striped suit, tatters all vest, spats, believe it or not, and all but a monocle. Uh, I, I say there, old man. Uh, yes? If you'll pardon me, I believe I overheard you inquiring at the desk for Donald Cronin, didn't I? Oh, yes. Do you know him? Oh, I most certainly do. Uh, but excuse me, I'm Percival Thronghurst Scatterday. Mr. Scatterday, I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Donald told me that he'd met you at his home. Uh, tell me, do you plan to accompany him on the ex- expedition to Thebes? Well, uh, yes. Excellent, excellent. It should result, you know, in one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. Think of it. The tomb of Kamashek. Yes. Do you know where Donald is now? Treasures, artifacts, and that should put to shame the ones that were excavated from the tomb of Tutankhamun. Yes, I'm sure. Well, but now... If history has told us the truth about Kamashek, uh, 18th dynasty, I believe... Not that I wouldn't know. But now, uh, Mr. Scanaday... It's important that I reach Donald Cronin just uh, no, as soon as... No, 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 no. Now that I think of it, Kamashek... Kamashek was 12th dynasty. Oh, Mr. Scanaday, uh, if... Uh, but, but he couldn't be, because that was the era... Oh, oh, yes, yes, I remember now. It was the 18th, the same period in which the great temple of Queen Hatshepsut was erected at Daya el-Bahari, at Thebes, of course. Uh, you've seen that, of course. No, I haven't. Oh, magnificent and thrilling. Now, look here, sir. Uh, but now, Mr. Dollar... I've got to reach Donald Cronin, so if you'll excuse me... Uh, Mr. Dollar, please, you say you are going with Donald. You do know about the curse of Kamashek. Yes, yes, I will. Oh, then you'll certainly arrange not to be present at the opening of the sarcophagus. Why? Well, as I'm certain you know, all the preliminary work has been accomplished by the advance party, of course. So I understand. The antechamber of the tomb was opened over a month ago. Oh. Well, it simply means that as soon as Donald arrives, they will penetrate to the sepulchral chamber and the sarcophagus itself. Well, uh, Mr. Donald, it was engraved on the stone slab barring the way to the last chamber... Mantak ko fore el, and so on. What's that supposed to be? Uh, the warning, my boy, the warning. That whosoever violate the tomb and desecrate the body of the noble pharaoh by contact therewith shall quickly die. <laughs> you don't believe in those things, do you? <laughs> oh. As I always understood it. Those warnings were just put there to discourage thieves from robbing those old things. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I only ask that you remember what happened to those who violated the tomb of Tutankhamun. Oh. Well, couldn't the deaths of the people who entered that tomb be due simply to coincidence? Rather, things, circumstances quite apart from their having done so? Of course, of course they could, but were they? Mr. Dollar, I assure you that if it were not for the warning of the curse of Kamashek, I would be the first to want to enter that tomb. Instead, I have refused to go on the expedition at all. 
Uh, take care of Don. Well, that's what I'm being hired to do. And of yourself, sir. Yeah, sure. Now, sorry, but I'm anxious to reach Donald, and you say you've seen him here at the club? Yes, only last evening. He was here making some of his final preparations. Well, do you know where he is now? Yes. Well, where? At his uncle's place in Stamford, Connecticut. You're sure? Uh, as sure as I am that you've not heeded my warning about the curse of Kamashek. But I beg you, Mr. Dollar, for the welfare of Donald Cronin and your uh, Yeah, sure. Thanks. If this were a mystery story instead of an accounting of expenditures on a case, I'd tag Percy Scatterday as a prime suspect for whatever might happen later. Like the man who tries to throw you off his own trail by suggesting that somebody else is gunning for you. But I decided he was just an old fogey who had been turned down on the Kamashek expedition was trying to justify his own shortcomings with the tales about the curse. But you know something? I was wrong. I should have listened to him a little more understandingly. <laughs> Item 8, 75 cents, taxi to the office of Harrison and Dillman and Company to see David Wilt, the man Eric Turnbull had named as his stockbroker. The reason? The remark the bank teller had made about closing out an account... As it turned out, my timing was perfect. Sit down, sir. Sit down. I'll be with you just as soon as I finish this phone call. Oh, sure. Thanks. Hello. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, but someone just stepped into my office. If you'd rather be left alone, I'll... No, that's all right. Now, as I started to say, if you dispose of the gold metal mining stock, your holdings will be reduced to practically nothing. Yes. Yes. That's right. Well, but, Mr... Yes, but Mr. Tur... Look, you're sure you wouldn't rather I come back another time? Very well, very well. It's just that I hate to see what was once a very strong investment program. Very well, Mr. Turnbull, if you insist. Turnbull? Yes, yes. Goodbye. Now, now... Sir. Eric Turnbull, Mr. Will? Yes, but... Now, just a minute, sir. It was very remiss of me to mention the client's name in front of you, at least under the circumstances. Whatever I may have said on the phone just now was quite confidential. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I can only ask that you discreetly forget anything you may have heard. Not by a long shot. What's this? Who are you, sir? Dollar, I believe the receptionist said. That's right, Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. And that conversation told me just what I came here to try to charm you into telling me. Mr. Dollar, please remember this. That was entirely confidential. None of your business. Here, yeah, my credentials. Yeah. Well? Now, you remember something. So far as Eric Turnbull is concerned, my coming here is entirely confidential. None of his business. Goodbye, Mr. Wilt. So the wealthy Eric Turnbull wasn't so wealthy after all. Big investments in the stock market, he'd said. But they didn't look so big anymore. And the closing out of bank accounts. Item 9.30 cents phone call to Dorothy Harkness. I just called to tell you, Dorothy, that if it'll be any satisfaction to you, I'm going to make the trip to Egypt. Oh, thank heaven, and Donald will have some protection against the machinations of his uncle. Oh, gal, that sounds like a line out of an old melodrama. I know you don't believe me, Mr. Dollar, but I'm so sure that Eric Turnbull is plotting against Donald's life. You know something? I'm beginning to feel a little that way, too. Then you did believe me. In spite of the way you poo-pooed everything I said, are you, are you and Donald leaving together? I can't seem to find him. Do you know where he is? No, not there. Well, he'll surely call me before he leaves. Well, if he does, have him get in touch with me. Where, Mr. Dollar? Right now, I'm going out to Eric Turnbull's house. After that, I'll be back in Hartford. <laughs> Item 10, $7 even, train fare back to Stamford and taxi to the Turnbull residence in the hope that there I would find Donald Cronin, the real principal in this case, and the one person I hadn't yet talked to. But it was Eric Turnbull who met me at the door. Mr. Dollar, I'm glad to see you. Come in, come in. Have you seen my nephew, Donald? Well, no. Isn't he here? No. Nor is he at the Explorers Club. I've called him several times. I'm worried about him. In his present frame of mind... I'm worried about him, too, Mr. Turnbull, but not for the same because reason. Because of that girl, Dorothy Harkness. Yes, sir. No, that isn't what I meant. In his present frame of mind, he's likely to jump off on his flight to Egypt without... Look here. I wonder if he's with her. No, that much I do know. Oh, I wish to heaven he would call if anything happens If to anything happens to him, you'd love it, wouldn't you? What? What did you say? I've done a little checking up on you, Mr. Turnbull, since I last talked to you. What do you mean? 
In a case as involved as this, it's necessary to check all the angles. Everything, everyone, even the man who hires you. Has that girl been poisoning your mind against me, too? Your banker, from whom I picked up the American Express checks, let it slip that your account is in pretty bad shape. Non-existent now, as a matter of fact. Go on, Mr. Dollar. And your stockbroker, quite inadvertently, made it all too plain that the big investments you told me about aren't so big after all. Mr. Dollar... All right, tie that in with the fact that if anything does happen to Donald, you'll come into his estate. You've said enough! But it's true, isn't it? You laid so much stress on Dorothy and the museum getting his 100,000 life insurance... But you're the one who would really benefit by his death. Dollar, you have talked with one banker, with one stockbroker. Why, in your snooping around, didn't you talk with the others who hold my account? Like who? Like, it's none of your business. But if what you are implying were true, why in heaven's name would I ever ask you to come in and protect my nephew? As a cover-up? I should knock you down with my bare fists, and believe me, my boy, I could do it. Now listen to me. I'm listening. If I didn't have any money, how could I afford to give you the 5000 in expense money? Pay whatever other costs may be involved in your employment. And why do you suppose, in spite of this high-handed attitude of yours, I'm still begging you to stay on this case? See, Donald, Mr. Dollar, talk with him. You'll find that in spite of the angry scene between us, I'm concerned only with his welfare. That I want to protect him. That I want you to protect him. Wait, wait, that's Donald. Now, let me take it. Well, now, just a minute. Johnny Dollar. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar, I was calling Mr. Turnbull. Mr. Scannady? Uh, yes, at the Explorers Club. Uh, Mr. Dollar, I just talked to a couple of fellow members who saw him off. Saw him? Donald Cronin? Yes, last night. His plane has probably reached Cairo by now. Uh, fooled all of us, didn't he? Yeah. Thanks. Well, I thought you'd want to... Well? Donald left for Egypt last night. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Then... Please, I beg of you, go. In heaven's name, go to him. Stay with him. Protect him. For a long moment, Eric Turnbull simply stood there, sobbing, pleading with his tear-filled eyes. And suddenly, I don't know why, I found that I believed him. I wish now that he'd been lying. Two lives might have been saved. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a flight into darkness, and when day has come, there's blood on the desert sands. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Have you found Donald yet, Mr. Dollar? Have you been... Oh, this is Dorothy Hart. Yeah, I know. And no, I haven't found Donald Cronin. It wasn't at his uncle's place? Johnny, you must find him. Talk to him. Talk him out of making the trip to Egypt. Dorothy. If he does, he'll die. His uncle will see to it that he dies. Look, Dorothy. You must find him. Stop him. I'm afraid it's a little late for that. What? He took off on a direct flight to Egypt early yesterday. Oh. Has at least a 36-hour start, at least. Johnny, you must after him. On the first plane, I can get to Cairo. Tonight.
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continues. <laughs> Item 10. Taxi, train to New York, and cab to the airport. $9.45. Item 11. Round trip plane fare to Cairo, Egypt. $1,305. I was tired, and the steady drone of the four powerful engines lulled me to sleep in no time. I think I might have slept most of the way to Paris, which was to be our first stop, except for hunger fans and the appropriate ministrations of a very attractive stewardess. Usually on such a long flight, I try to make friends with everybody aboard, just to shorten the trip. And I did this time, except for one man who sat four or five seats behind me. He was a rather hefty individual, dark complexion. About 30, I guess, who didn't budge from his seat during the entire flight. And every time I approached him to pass the time of day, he immediately made like he was asleep. So he wanted to be alone. But when I settled down into my seat, next to a lovely petite brunette named Carolyn, who was... Now, that's beside the point, except for purely personal reasons that I'll pursue further when I get back to the States. Uh, yeah. The point is that in primping a bit and replenishing her lipstick, she held up a small mirrored compact... And reflected in it, I could see that the dark complexion man was not only quite wide awake, but watching me every second of the ride. In a rather strange way, too. Concentrated. Like you'd watch a fly you're planning to swat. And every time I'd turn around, he'd promptly shut his eyes and feign sleep again. Finally, it was early evening, we sat down at Le Bourget, the airport on the outskirts of Paris. Since this was Carolyn's destination, during the short layover, I helped her get her baggage and extracted the promise of a date in New York when she returned in the fall. Yeah. Yeah, I guess Paris does it. Well, anyhow, after she piled into a taxi, I wandered around for a bit thinking and decided to reboard the plane, look up the dark, silent passenger and have it out with him. But apparently I'd waited too long. As I passed a narrow sort of alley beside a baggage shed, he decided to have it out with me. In here, darling, quick. Huh? What? In here, where we won't be safe. Oh, now, just a minute, fella. Who are you? What do you want? Yes, that's what? what? You? Don't. All right, now. Always a big idea, mister. You gonna talk or do you want some more of this? All right. All right, I'll talk. Who put you up to this? Come on, no, come on. No, I can't tell you that. You want a bet? What? All right, now start talking. I said... All right. All right, I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnbull. It was Turnbull. What? Turnbull? Here. That's right. Frederick Turnbull. Why? Oh, should I know? I, I do a lot of strong arm for him. Go on, go on. So he pays me good to get you out of the way, so I should ask questions? Well, maybe he'll have a few to ask you if you ever get back to the States. Now roll over. Huh? Go. Go. Hey. All right. <laughs> Yeah, hey, wait. What are you doing? That's right. my passport. That's right, mister. That's exactly what it was. When you get back on your feet, you can try to figure out how to go on from here without it. Best in your dirty... Sorry, man. buddy. I gotta catch a fight. <laughs> I suppose I should have turned the unfriendly thug over to the French police, but figured he'd have trouble enough liking a passport to keep him out of my way for a while. The only charges I could make against him would be for assault. Time was of the essence, too since Donald Cronin actually was two days ahead of me, and it was important that I join him at the tomb of Kamashek as soon as possible. At least so I thought. Until I entered the main building of the airport again and heard my name being called on the PA system. The information desk showed me where to take a transatlantic phone call. Johnny Dollar. Dollar. This is Eric Turnbull. Well, well. Thank goodness I was able to reach you during your power stop. I'm glad you did, Mr. Turnbull, because there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about. When will we uh, return, Mr. Dollar? What's the matter with right now? And may I suggest that you take the first plane back here? First, I want a little explanation for a beating I just took for... 
Wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you say? Come back here and we'll settle our accounts. The case is closed. The... What? Donald is dead. Where? How? I just received word from one of the members of the expedition. In Egypt? Yes, the, the curse of Kabashek has been fulfilled. Or was he murdered? I'm afraid it was the same mysterious death that's overtaken so many who violated those old tombs. Well, I don't believe it. Any more than you believe in that so-called curse the last time I talked to you. I know. I was wrong. Heaven forgive me for letting the boy go. Look, Mr. Turnbull, things just don't make sense at all. Come back, Mr. Dollar, and we'll talk about it here. Listen to me. Yes? Before I decide what I'm going to do, I want to know why you hired a thug to try to put me out of the picture. What? I... I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you don't. Well, he made it plenty plain that he's handled strong-arm jobs for you before. That's impossible. Gave me your name as the man who's hired him many times. Frederick Turn... Oh, hold it. Hold it a minute. Dollar, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I have to leave... Maybe I will go back to New York at that. Mr. Dollar! It suddenly dawned on me that I must have been slightly befuddled by the partial beating I'd taken earlier. You know, when the thug made his little confession a few minutes before. Uh, I'll talk, I'll talk. It was Turnblow hired me. Frederick Turnblow. Frederick Turnblow, he said, instead of Eric Turnbull. Sure, they sound alike. But a guy who's done a lot of strong-arm jobs, knows the guy, the right name of the guy that hired him, that can mean only one thing. Someone had instructed that thug to say he'd been hired by Turnbull. But who? I canceled out the rest of my flight to Cairo, made reservations back to New York, and then while waiting for that plane, ran up item 13, $82 American. On phone calls to whomever I could dig up among the Egyptian government authorities who had been overseeing the excavation of Kamashek's tomb. What little I learned was pretty much summed up by the British doctor who had been a member of the expedition. Very mysterious, Mr. Donner. He, because of the superstition of by violating the tomb, only two of our people even touched any of the bones to find within it. Yeah. And incidentally, that is all we found. The tomb had been thoroughly ransacked by thieves, probably centuries ago. Yeah, but you were saying, Doctor. Oh, yes, yes. Only two touched any of the remains. One was a native carrier, as soon as the bones had been properly sprayed with a preservative. Uh -huh. And the other was Donald Cronin, who, for some reason or other, wrapped up the bones and sent them by air to his uncle, a uh, Mr. Eric Turnbull in the United States. Oh. Well, go on, go on. Well, that's really all, Mr. Dollar. Except, of course, that both of them have died of some strange malady that the authorities have not been able to determine. And that's why the tomb has been officially closed again. Hey, listen, tell me something. Could the bones have been accessible to anyone before those two touched them? Yes, to anyone in the party. Well, now, don't tell me that you suspect... Oh, listen, mister, I don't know what I suspect. But I don't believe it was any curse of a long-dead pharaoh that killed those two men. Look, tell me this, will you? Have any of the expedition returned to America? Well, of course, the authorities have here no reason for holding them. You haven't answered my question. No. Well, only the two young men that Donald brought along with him. Who were they? Uh, Carl Fortina. Well, who's he? From New York. Like Donald himself, he's an archaeologist. And the other? One of his colleagues at the museum in, uh, hmm, I, I believe it's in Stamford. What's his name? Well, he's a young archaeological expert. Son of a curator at the museum, as I recall. Why? As his name is Walter Harkness. Well, I'll be. But surely you don't... Doctor, do you go right ahead and hang those two deaths on good old King Kamashek. Me? I'm going after a couple of live suspects. <laughs> There was plenty of time before the New York plane for a quick look for my heavy-handed pal in the alley where I'd left him. But he'd either crawled away or been picked up by the gendarmes, and I didn't have time for a session with them. Item 14, 150 for some food. Then aboard the plane, and we took off. Ah, it was a rough case to figure. Actually, of course, the insurance angle was done and over with. It ended with Donald Cronin's death. And two people would benefit by his death, both of them number one suspects. One, his uncle, Eric Turnbull, who would now take over the million-dollar estate. The other, Dorothy Harkness, who would gain a big chunk of life insurance money, along with the museum, of course, that her father... Who hold everything? Her father, Adam Harkness, who opposed her marriage to Donald, 
who looked on him simply as a source of income for the museum who told everything is right. There was the son, too, Walter Harkness, who ducked back to the States the minute Donald died. How did he fit into this? Believe me, in spite of all the talk in it, the belief in it, the one thing I was sure had nothing to do with the whole matter was the curse of Kamashek. Nevertheless, call it hunch or whatever you like, the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that I'd find all the answers in a package that Donald had mailed back to the States. A package containing the bones of Pharaoh Kamashek. Hello, Haskins. Mr. Tremble, then? Yes, and I'm sure he wishes to see you. It's a frightful thing about Master Donald. Uh... And how does Mr. Tremble feel about it? Terribly broken up. But... Oh, but, but please come in. He's in the library. Thanks. He just received a package the poor boy sent to him before he... Wait, Haskins. Has he opened it yet? He was examining the contents when the doorbell... Good heavens. Mr. Turnbull. He's fallen from his hands, Mr. Dollar. Dollar, he's... Mm-hmm. Yeah, Haskins. He's dead. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Before I do, please let me thank you for the letters you keep sending us about the program. So many come in every day that it's become quite a chore to answer them, but you know something? I love it. As a matter of fact, your letters are appreciated by all of us who are involved in the production and presentation of the show. Our director, the writers, the various members of our cast, and our excellent technical crew. So please don't stop. Tomorrow, the wind-up. And a sorry example of what the lust for money can sometimes do to nice people. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar starring Bob Bailey is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Sinclair returning your call, Stinky. Oh, hi, Leonard. Where have you been, Johnny? It's been years. Yeah, I know. Listen, can you give me a hand? Who got poison this time? Two of them. I hope it's poison. And that you can prove it for me. We'll try. What do I do? Meet me here at the home of Eric Turnbull in Stamford, Connecticut. Okay, but Johnny... Give you the address in a minute. But Johnny, what do you mean you hope somebody got poison? Because if they didn't, I'm going to go off my rocker. What? Because the only other possible cause of death could be a curse. The curse of Kamashek. Who? An Egyptian king who died a couple of dozen centuries ago. What? Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From 
Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Winter Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the curse of Kamashek matter. Expense account continued. I called Dr. Leonard St. Clair, an old school chum, because I knew him to be one of the foremost toxicologists in the country. And I was telling the truth. I hoped it could be shown that some kind of poison killed Donald Cronin and subsequently his uncle, Eric Turnbull. Both apparently had believed in the curse of the old Egyptian pharaoh, a curse that was to befall anyone who violated his ancient tomb on the banks of the Nile. Donald had done this in excavating the tomb. But his uncle here in Stamford had only touched the bones that Donald had airmailed to him. He was opening the packet that Master Donald... God bless his soul. That Master Donald had sent him just before he died, there at the tomb in Egypt. I brought them in here to the library there for him, sir. Go on, Haskins. Well, then you rang the doorbell. I, I left him with it, and uh, you and I came in here. Yeah, yes. From the curse of Gamashek, Mr. Dollar. Oh, Haskins, I don't believe it. A friend of mine, Dr. St. Clair, will be here shortly, and he'll be but able to... shouldn't we notify the police? No, sir? no, no, later. But, but leave my poor employee's body just lying there? For the time being, yes. Until Dr. St. Clair examines it. Sir, as you wish, sir. That's what I wish. Haskins. One person in this confusing mess I hadn't given a second thought to. As it turned out, there wasn't time, for Len St. Clair arrived a few minutes later in a car equipped like a miniature laboratory. No doubt as a result of the police work he was frequently called on to do. First, of course, in his capacity as an M.D., he made a thorough examination of Eric Turnbull's body for purposes of death certificate data. Well, I'm all right, Johnny. I'm sure of it. At least as sure as I can be, short of making an autopsy. But what kind of poison, Len? And how administered? Well, at the risk of making it sound like a dime novel, I'd say it was an extremely rare, uh, well... Well, what? Come on. Well, it's something I haven't heard of in years. Related to the old Indian arrow poison. It's very difficult to detect. Can you make sure? Yes, if you'll help me drag some of my equipment in from the car, including a cage of white mice. What? Yeah, on which to experiment with samples of the stuff. Samples from those old bones out of the tomb? Mm, that's right. Now, from what you've told me, only two people have touched the bones since the minute they were discovered in the tomb. Three. A native carrier, Donald Cronin, and now the late Eric Turnbull. And they've all died. But, Johnny... Yeah? The poison I'm thinking of would hardly have been put on those bones in the time of the pharaohs. Oh, and by the way, I hope no one's touched them here. No, I've left them just as they are in that mailing wrapper. Good. Because it could be fatal. I'll carefully scrape them when we get the equipment in here. We brought in what Len needed for his work, including the white mice. Then I closed him in the library and left him to his experiments. To a bit of research, too, for he'd brought in a couple of thick books on toxicology. As a matter of routine, I phoned the local coroner and then tried to reach Dorothy Harkness. Her number didn't answer. I was about to drive over to her little apartment when Len came out of the library. I was right, Johnny. Curaba arsenium. Is that the name of the stuff? Uh-huh. In its powder form, absorbed into the pores of the skin, it could be fatal almost immediately. And listen to me. Yeah? Somehow, between the time the bones of that old king were discovered and the time that Donald Cronin touched them, somebody put that poison on him. How? Without endangering himself. By keeping it in aqueous solution until the bones were sprayed with it. Sprayed with it? Wait a minute. Yeah? Sprayed with it, huh? A doctor... An Englishman who was on the expedition told me that the bones had been sprayed with some kind of preservative even before the native carrier touched them. You're thinking what I'm thinking? Yeah, right. Instead of preservative, it was the poison. Well, who sprayed them? I've got a wild idea, Len. But if it's right, it'll sew up this whole case. I wonder who that is. Well, while you're finding out, I'm going back and recheck these tests. But only as a matter of routine, because I'm sure I'm right. <laughs> I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, Haskins? Miss Dorothy Harkness is here, sir. Huh? And her young brother, Walter. Shall I ask them in, sir? By all oh, means. Oh, thing that has happened. Is that really the way you feel about it, Dorothy? What? Yes, just what do you mean by that, Mr. Dollar? I'm Walter Harkness. Well, come right in, Walter. Because I have a sneaking suspicion you're the boy I've been looking for. What? Your conscience finally begin to hurt you? Would you like to sit down and write your confession now? What are you talking about? Or did you and Dorothy just come here to put on a front? You know, as a cover-up? 
I don't know what you're talking about. Johnny, what are you saying? Sit down, both of you, because I'm going to be saying plenty. But look here, Mr. Dollar. Sit down, right. I said. Now sit down. All right, Dorothy, we'll begin with you. Johnny, I don't understand. Now listen to me. Can... From what you told me, and I've no other reason for believing it except that you told me, Donald Cronin was in love with you. It was true. And I At any not... rate, he made you part beneficiary of his $100,000 life insurance policy. Half of it, I believe. A cool $50,000. You say or oh, I'll be think... quiet. Mr. Dollar. I'm coming to you right now, Walter. You're working for the museum where your father is curator of archaeology. The museum that has depended quite a lot not only on Donald Cronin's scientific contributions, but his monetary help as well. That may be true, but I'll look here. The museum. You... The other beneficiary of Donald's insurance. Also $50,000. Dollar, if you're implying that I had anything to do with Donald's death... You can shut gain... up, too, and let me talk. This is the first chance I've had to begin to tie this case up. The first time any of the crazy elements in it made sense. No, wait, tell me this. Eric Turnbull was opposed to Donald's interest in the museum, wasn't he? Well, yes, Sure. But... And I'll bet my bottom dollar that if something happened to both Donald and his uncle, the estate worth nearly a million was willed by Donald to the museum. That's true, Johnny, but there's no... No wonder Eric Turnbull was afraid for Donald's life. Because he knew who would ultimately benefit most by his death. No wonder he hated you, Dorothy. Johnny! Oh, Johnny, you can't mean you think that I would... No, that no, I... no, no. I think you were only being used as a tool, Dorothy. You told me yourself how your father opposed your marrying him. How his only interest was in getting money for the museum. Is that true, Walter? Yes, Mr. Dollar, that is true. But if you mean to imply that I or any of us was involved in Donald's Walter. death... Walter... The more I think about it, the more I'm sure you are directly involved. Uh, now, sit down. It's a lie. I swear to it, Mr. Dolly. You're wrong. It's a lie. We'll see about that. Because there's one thing you may have overlooked. I know what killed Donald Crump. You, you do? Oh, yes, Walter. Just as well as you do. But I don't. I, I haven't the least... The curse of Kamashek. The curse John. of Kamashek. Not by a long shot. Was it, Walter? I told you, I haven't the slightest... All right, then I... tell me this. Immediately the pile of bones was found at Kamashek's tomb before anyone touched them. I refuse to touch them, B. Will you listen to me? Before anybody touched them, somebody sprayed those bones with a so-called preservative. And I mean so-called. I don't know why you should. Oh? Well, that's common practice these days, in case you don't know it, but I fail to see... What, what was supposed to be a preservative was in reality a deadly poison. What? Oh, come on now, Walter. But you're wrong. You must be wrong. That's impossible. You no, know, you're very convincing, I must admit. Well, it's true. I applied that preservative, Mr. Dollar. Oh, you did? Yes. Aqueous solution, wasn't it? Of course. And I'll bet you washed your hands very carefully immediately afterward, didn't you? Yes, of course I did, because I was told to. By whom? By... Hold it. Tell me, Walter. Walter. Yes? Do you know anything about a man who tried to intercept me on my way to Egypt? To make sure I didn't get there until the bones of the pharaoh were sent to Eric Turnbull and that Donald Cronin died? No. No, I don't. Believe. Then answer me this one. Did you make up the, we'll call it, preservative that you used over there? No. Then who did? And who told you to be sure to wash your hands immediately after using it? Well? Walter! Oh, no! I, I'm afraid so, Dorothy. Oh, no! Better tell me, Walter. I beg your pardon, Mr. Dollar, but Mr. Harkness Sr. is here, too. Mr. Dollar, I'm Adam Harkness, curator of archaeology at the museum. Well, well, Mr. Harkness, I'm really glad to see you. Dorothy, Walter, Mr. Dollar... I've come to pick up the bones from the grave of Kamashek that I understand Donald Cronin sent to his uncle instead of to me through some misunderstanding. Oh, yeah, sure. I had a notion you'd want to pick up those bones, Dr. Harkness. And I'll give them to you on one condition. Oh? What is that? That you take them out of the package in which they arrived here with your bare hands. That you carry them out of this house also in your bare hands. Why? That's a strange... Will you? Of course not. Why? Why, because such priceless relics are too fragile, too... Too full of a deadly poison that you had them sprayed with? Furaba arsenium, I believe it's called. I don't know what you're... 
Walter, what have you been telling us? It's true, isn't it, Father? Well, Dr. Harkness... I don't know how you found out, Della, but I'll tell you this. You won't ever live. Wait a minute, put that thing down. Father! Wait a minute! Daddy! Johnny? Yeah. You stopped him, all right, Len. But I think he'll live. Good. I knew all the police work I've been doing would come in handy sometime. Thanks for barging in at the psychological moment. I was only coming in to confirm the results of my tests. I guess Dr. Harkness had already done it. Yeah. So, I guess the museum will profit mightily from half the insurance and all of the estate of Donald Cronin. The museum, that is, without Dr. Adam Harkness. Expense account total, including transportation back to Hartford, $985. Remarks? Well, doesn't mean a thing, I know, but uh, I kind of wonder what I might have found if I'd been assigned to investigate the deaths of the people who excavated some of those other old Egyptian tombs. Tombs that had a curse on them. <laughs> Interesting thought, isn't it? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a search for $80,000 that was never there. And a body that was never there. Yet both of them had to be found. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in this week's cast were Paul Duval, Alan Reed Sr., Dick Crenna, Virginia Gregg, Ben Wright, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Barney Phillips, James McCallion, and Les Tremaine. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Jimmy Sayer, in an allied life, Johnny. Oh, hi, Jim. How are you? The way I feel now, the way I'm going to feel depends on you. Okay, let's have it. Remember a guy named King Tut? The Egyptian mummy they dug out of a tomb full of treasure a few years ago. That's right. Well, don't tell me you held a policy on him, Jim. <laughs> Seriously, now. You'll also remember there was supposed to be a curse on anybody who molested his tomb. Yeah, supposed to be. But, of course, anybody knows that stuff's a lot of malarkey. Is it? Isn't it? Better reserve judgment, Johnny, until you hear about the curse of Kamashek. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the curse of Kamashek matter. 
Expense account item one, one dollar even. Taxi to the office of Internet Allied Life to talk with Jim Sayer. The conference was brief and not very enlightening. I'd much rather have you see Mr. Turnbull and get the story from him yourself. As I said in the beginning, he's a very important client. What's more to the point, he can tell you about it much better than I can. Jim, to coin a cliche, you're being just as clear as mud. Also, by the way, he specifically asked for you. Oh, how come? Well, it seems he liked the way you handled the Parkinson case a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, Emily Parkinson, the widow who died. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. She was his sister. And, well, go down and see him, Johnny. I... I honestly can't tell you anything more than I already have about the thing. James, you have told me nothing. But he can. And you can pick up a nice fee on it. As a favor to me. No. For that nice fee. Jim promised to phone Eric Turnbull that I was on my way, and I ran of items two and three, four dollars and twenty cents, for a quick lunch and train fare to Stanford. There I was met by a chauffeured car and driven to Turnbull's house. Far out of the town on Birchbrook Road, it was set on one of the biggest, most beautifully landscaped pieces of property I'd ever seen. The fine old home looked as though it had stood there in all its straight-laced dignity for a hundred years, and stolid against the changing world would stand for another hundred. In sharp contrast, a live, clean Studebaker Golden Hawk was parked in the sweeping driveway at the front. Haskins, the chauffeur, had explained on the way that he doubled his butler, so I wasn't particularly surprised when he opened the door for me... Since you received the call about your coming, sir, you are to go right in while I take the motor car to the garage. Unless... He glanced at the Golden Hawk quickly back of me, then, having left the word unless hanging in midair, climbed back behind the wheel and drove off. Well, he said go right in. Inside, the house was a classic. From the tile-floored reception room with its walls of oak and the broad staircase leading to the second floor, I could look into the huge living room, finished in polished mahogany with a leaded glass window at one side and thick oriental rugs on the floor. A fireplace that seemed to take in a whole wall, and fine mahogany furniture that glowed with a beautiful patina. Beyond that, I could see the library, golden and walnut. And sitting at a broad desk was a man, his face red with anger shaking his fist at a very attractive girl of 22 or 3 who stood before him, obviously distressed by what was going on. Don't call me Uncle Eric. I'm not your uncle now, and by heaven, if I have my way, I never will be. (coughs) You're not married to him yet, my girl, and if I have anything to say about it, you... Oh, Mr. Dollar, isn't it? Yes, sir. Mr. Turnbull? That's right. Come in, come in. And Dorothy, Mr. Dollar and I wish to be alone. The girl stood there for a brief moment, looking at the man with an expression of utter futility in her face. Then, without so much as a glance at me, he turned and left by the door that I had just entered. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. Somewhat embarrassing to you, I'm sure. But it's... Well, it's something I'll have to tell you about later. Sit down, please. Thanks. May I pour you a drink? I must confess, I feel like a Jewish one at the moment. No, no thanks, Mr. Turnbull. I uh, think I'll pass it. I suppose it is a little early, but... Well... Good luck. Now. Jim Sayer, an inner ally, tells me you have an insurance problem. Actually, not yet. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Dollar. Please do. I'm asking you to help me not as an insurance investigator, but as a man I feel I can trust. (laughs) But you don't really know me, Mr. Turnbull. Oh, on the contrary, I do very well. As a result of your handling of the case of my widowed sister, Emily, when she died a few years ago. Matter of fact, you and I met very briefly at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, Emily Parkinson. The case involved a lot of phony relatives who filed claims on her estate. Yes, that's right. And your clever trapping of those false claimants and that cheap attempts to gain part of Emily's fortune was... I understand that several of them are still serving sentences. Yeah, I believe so. Which is quite what they deserve. If there's anything... Only his uncle is going to stand for you. But there's been no claim file, no reason for one. I know. Mr. Turnbull does... Well, kind of unusual things now and then, and I guess this is one of them. Unless he's trying to prevent whatever might cause a claim to be filed. Mr. Dollar, I don't know what Mr. Turnbull has told you about me, but I'm sure it wasn't good. I'm afraid we don't get along very well. Well, it's uh, pretty obvious he doesn't like your interest in his nephew, Donald. I've known Donald since school, Mr. Dollar, and we, we hope to get married. At least Donald does. Oh? And what about you? Well, I don't know. I got the impression from Mr. Turnbull you were doing a pretty good job of getting Donald into your clutches. 
isn't the way it is at all. I've been seeing a great deal of each other, and Donald is asking me to marry him. And I'm fond of him, Mr. Dollar, terribly fond of him. But so far as marriage is concerned, I... I'm not sure. What do you mean? I can't help wondering all the time if he isn't hoping to marry me just as, a, as an escape from his uncle. Uh-huh. Would you marry him? If I was sure. Of, of him. You'd be sure of an awful lot of money, Dorothy. What? The minute he reached 30, that is. Mr. Turnbull has poisoned your mind, Mr. Donald. What money Donald has or may have has nothing to do with it. That sort of thinking is filthy. I, um, uh, I guess you mean that, don't you? Yes. I think I've loved Donald ever since my father brought him into the museum. Your father? Yes, he's curator of archaeology. Well, how does he feel about Donald and you? His only interest in Donald is in the money, the financial support he gives the museum. Oh, since nice. mother died, he's become a grasping, self-centered old man whose only interest is in the museum. I see. I don't live with him anymore. Well, then I take it he opposes any thought of your marrying Donald. I'll have to string him along. His money and scientific contributions. But Donald is making something of himself. Instead of wasting his life in idle luxury, Mr. Turnbull would have it. Or would he rather have done increase the family fortune? No. No, just not spend it. That's all he cares about. So if anything should happen to Donald, there would be more left for Mr. Eric Turnbull. And that's why I called him. But I'm afraid that if Donald does go on this expedition to Egypt, something will happen to him. Oh, now, wait a minute. Turnbull has objected strenuously to this latest expedition. You don't know that. Either of them. They're of the same stock, and they're both stubborn, determined, and willful, and his uncle is clever. Clever enough to play on this stubbornness. Capitalize on it. What's that supposed to mean? He knows that the surest way to keep Donald from doing something is to insist that he do it. Don't been that way. Are you sure you haven't been reading too much psychology? It's true. And in spite of Donald's academic maturity, he's almost like a child in some things. Emotional sometimes. But that's another reason why I wonder if Donald really wants to marry me. If he loves me enough. Or if he's simply rebelling against his uncle. You feel then that Mr. Turnbull is opposing the expedition to be sure that Donald will make it? Yes. Because he doesn't quietly reason with Donald, talk things out. He shouts, he storms, he threatens. And that gets Don's back hair up more determined to go than ever. Wouldn't it do the same to you? <laughs> Maybe so. I'm afraid that if he does go, he'll never come back. You honestly don't want him to go? No. Just what you think might happen to him? This curse of Kamashek you mentioned? I think that would be the excuse for his uncle to have something happen to him. What is this curse? Do you remember King Tutankhamen? Well, I remember hearing and reading something about him, old Egyptian pharaoh. His tomb had a curse on it, too. But because they believed it would yield important historical data and some of the treasure of those ancient dynasties, an expedition went to the Valley of the Kings and excavated it anyhow. You really have on this stuff, aren't you? Donald's interest in it, I guess, but listen to me. One after another, people who were involved in that expedition died under very mysterious circumstances. Yeah, I remember. Even Lord Carnivan himself. They said that he died from the results of a mosquito bite and pneumonia. But the other deaths were not so easily explained away. Not even by able scientists and doctors. You believe in the curse of King Tut, then? And now the curse of Kamashek? No. Well, I don't. But from what you just told me... There have been too many other tombs, all bearing warnings, where the people who dug into them touched the treasures in them, even touched the remains of the kings, had no harm at all come to them. Well, then I'm afraid I don't see what you're driving at. This, Johnny... Any mysterious death of someone who's explored one of these ancient tombs will be accepted as a result of the curse, don't you see? It's an open door to murder. You know something, to me it all sounds a little far-fetched. No. Because of Eric Turnbull. Because I'm sure he wants Donald out of the way. For his money? This terrible friction between them, this antagonism that's been building up for years. And it's reached a point where either one of them would be glad to see the other out of the way. But Eric Turnbull is the only one who is evil enough to do something about it. Well, i got to admit, the sparks kind of flew between them when I saw them together. And don't forget it would be to his uncle's advantage if Donald were to die. He needs the money? Well, no, I guess he doesn't. Well, what about you? I'm doing all right at the museum. I'm earning enough to live on, and I'm happy in my life. Just the same as I understand it, you'd collect half of Donald's life policy. I hate you for even thinking about such a thing. 
I hoped you would help me. I think me. I detested this world. It's dishonesty. Well, I, uh, I guess most of us feel that way about it. Of course we do, if we have any shred of human dignity. Yeah. But now, uh, what is your problem? It uh, concerns Donald, uh, Emily's son, my nephew. I had expected him to arrive here before you, but suppose I go ahead anyway. Go ahead. Well, when her husband died, Emily was left with a considerable estate and their only child, Donald. The uh, estate's worth nearly a million now. Mm -hmm. With not too many years ahead of us, she wasn't well. She had lavished everything on the boy. The best of private schools, travel to Europe, all the things that befit one of our social and financial status. Before she died, she carefully put all of the money into a trust for Donald. A rather unique arrangement, which I control until he reaches the age of 30. What would happen if he didn't survive you? Would it all pass to you? Uh, uh, yes, yes. But of course, I have no particular need of it. When I sold Turnbull Enterprises some years ago, I, I think you can see that I'm pretty well fixed investments, you know. Yeah. At uh, any rate, since his mother died, Donald has been living here with me in accordance with her request that I care for him. And I've been glad to do it. I love the boy very dearly. How old is he, by the way? At 25. He'll be 26 in October. And what's he doing for a living? Uh, that's the whole point. There's no need for him to work for a living, as you put it. But in college, against my better judgment, he majored in archaeology and Egyptology. Mm. What did you want him to study? <laughs> Business and finance, of course. Forgive me for being so blunt, Dollar, but I see no sense whatsoever in his taking the fortune that his father spent so many years building up and squandering it on a lot of... of... Oh, oh, Donald, come in, come in. I received word at the club you wish to see me, Uncle Larry. What is it this... Oh. Mr. Dollar, this is my nephew, Donald Crumb. Uh, We've been talking about you, Donald. Oh? As a result of a newspaper item I just read, the effect that you're preparing for another expedition. That's right, sir. I'm going to the ancient city of Thebes in Egypt. Egypt? Since my trip last fall, I've done a lot of reading and research in New York and London. I'm convinced I've located the ancient tomb of the pharaoh Kamashek. Advance party's already begun excavation. I'll join them there. Do you realize the cost of this, this thing? Uncle Eric, it promises to be one of the most important archaeological finds of the century. You mean it might be if I let you go? If? Let me go. Uncle Eric, perhaps Mr. Dollar... Mr. Dollar can hear anything I have to say to you. You see, Dollar, we're finally getting to the point. Uh, yeah. Donald, I'll make no bones about it. I'm quite fed up with your wasting your time on these stupid, pointless expeditions. That's not the way the museum feels about them, sir. Well, that's the way I feel about them. Oh, wait, sir, please. Uh, Donald, isn't that your collection for Yucatan that the museum recently acquired? Why, yes, sir. My party and I were able to... I'm sure we don't care about your party and you. You're not only wasting your time, but your money. The money your father struggled an entire lifetime to gain. That money was left for me to spend in any way I see fit. Provided your handling of it meets my approval. When you're 30 and the estate passes completely into your hands, you can do anything you like with it. Buy the Brooklyn Bridge if you want. You probably will. But until then, I am legally in control of it. And now, finally, I have every intention of exercising that control. At least to the extent of seeing you don't squander any more of it on these foolhardy expeditions. I take it you've made several, Donald. Yes, sir, and he's opposed me in all of them. Because sooner or later you've got to learn that as the wealthy son of a family, it's up to you to carry on the tradition that's been set for you. To increase the fortune that's part of your family name, build even greater financial power, not to throw it away. Do you call my contributions to science and history a waste of money? Oh, now look, my boy, there's nothing selfish about my attitude in this matter. I'm thinking only of you and your future. The family name, if you alone, are left to uphold. Well... Why don't you give up this asinine idea of going to Egypt? No, sir. What do you mean, no? Let me finish. There's no point in your saying any more, Uncle. I'm going to explore the tomb of Kamashek. Now listen here, you I've young I've made Andre. all the arrangements, obtained the sponsorship of the museum, notified the universities that are interested in my work. I say you're not going. And I say I am, sir. You young fool. Don't you realize that I'm in a position to cut you off and out a penny? If you think I care, Uncle Eric, you're crazy. Then by heaven I will. So help me, Donald. I've tried to avoid this kind of situation, but you and your idiotic bullheadedness, your utter disregard for the responsibility and importance of your family, social status have made it inevitable. Now it's come in spite of all I've tried to do, and by heaven, I'll cut you off without a... Wait a minute. Donald, where are you going? Egypt. In the moment or two before Eric Turnbull recovered his poise enough to speak to me, my mind raced. This whole situation offered a big flock of wild possibilities. Obviously, the two were at sword points, had been for some time. Apparently, and I began to wonder about this, Turnbull had no need of Donald's money. Yet he seemed determined to keep him from spending it. 
and on what looked to me like a very worthy expedition. If Donald died, Turnbull had said, the estate would pass to him. Oh, and something else I wanted to find out about the girl who had been there when I arrived. But why? Why? Why did I want to know or need any answers? What could this whole affair possibly have meant to me? I'm no family counselor. I'm an... In- I guess I spoke that thought out loud. I'm an insurance investigator. Yes, Dollar. Which is another reason why I need your help in this affair. But I, uh, I just don't see it, Mr. I'm Turnbull. I'm afraid I must apologize for that little scene a moment ago. Oh, well, there's no need to. It was interesting, to say the least. Well, we didn't touch on the one thing that I wanted you to know about. That girl, Dorothy Harkness, his so-called fiancé. <laughs> oh. Thanks to a generous allowance, plus fees from the museum and some of the universities... Donald's insured his life for $100,000. 50000 for the museum. And a like amount for the girl. Through inner Allen? Yes. I'll put it to you bluntly. She has prodded him to go on these expeditions. And I believe she somehow hopes to engineer his death during this Kamashek project in order to collect on that policy. Do I make myself clear? If anything was clear about this situation, I certainly couldn't see it. More things that come flying at me from out of left field during the past half hour than I could cope with. And I wanted time to organize some kind of thinking. So I used a corny old device, glanced at my watch, said something about being late for an appointment back in Hartford. I apologized, promised to talk with him again tomorrow when there'd be more time. Haskins drove me back to the station and courteously waited until the train pulled in, then left. And it was then I noticed the little Studebaker Golden Hawk that I'd seen at the house pull up beside the platform, and the girl, Dorothy Harkness, jumped out and ran over to me. Mr. Dollar, I had to wait for Haskins to leave so he wouldn't see me. Oh? I must talk to you. Please call me. Here's the number. Is this about Donald? Yes. Because of the danger he's in. From Mr. Turnbull? No. And you must believe me. From the curse of Kamashek. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a little order starts to come out of the Department of Utter Confusion and a promise of murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. I have your phone stand, sir. Oh, thank you, operator. Hello? Oh, Mr. Dollar, I'm so glad you called. Well, you seem pretty anxious to talk about something, Miss Harkness. I am, about Donald and his uncle, and Donald's plan for the expedition to Egypt. To dig up the remains of the old pharaoh Kamashek? Yes. Can you come over here to see me, please? When I talked to you on the station platform a while ago, you said something about the curse of Kamashek. Yes. Isn't that nothing more nor less than superstition? No. Huh? I'm afraid that in this case, Mr. Dollar, it can mean nothing more nor less than murder. I'll take the first train. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From 
from Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Inter-Allied Life Insurance Company, Crutchfield Square, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, The Curse of Kamashek Matter. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 4, 320, cab to the station, train fare from Hartford to Stamford, and cab to the modest but attractive apartment of Dorothy Harkness. The short trip gave me time to think. Eric Turnbull, wealthy retired businessman, called me in on this case. Turnbull, uncle of young Donald Cronin, entirely in control of a large trust fund for the boy. Turnbull, who was determined to prevent him from making an expedition to the tomb of Kamashek, on the excuse that he suspected a plot against the boy's life, engineered by Dorothy Harkness, who was not only Donald's fiancée, but a beneficiary of his $100,000 life policy. So a talk with Dorothy Harkness seemed very much in order. Come in, Mr. Dollar. I'm so glad you were willing to come and talk with me. How are you, Miss Harkness? You make me sound so old. Dorothy, won't you sit down? All right. Thank you. But before we go any further, Dorothy, I think you ought to understand that I'm an insurance investigator, and so oh, far... Oh, I know that. Donald told me saved Donald's luck. Funny, though, isn't it? Funny. Harry Turnbull is my employer in this case, if there really is a case. Because he's smart. He's clever. He's clever enough to know that calling you in would help cover up anything he might do. All right, look. Suppose Eric Turnbull did want, did plan to get rid of Donald. How? I don't know. But this I do know. It's the thing that has scared me. On his last expedition, and he didn't realize it until afterwards, one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to have been paid separately by Mr. Turnbull. Why not? He probably wanted somebody there to look after Donald without his knowing. Listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents. That could have cost Donald his life. Oh, no, Dorothy, look. No, please. no. No, I can see that you don't believe anything I've told you. Dorothy, I think you're just building up something in your imagination. You don't doesn't... believe me. But at least do this. Remember. No matter what happens. Remember what I've told you. Somebody was lying. That was a cinch. But who? And why? Unless one of them really was plotting against the life of Donald Cronin. I couldn't get it out of my head that at least Eric Turnbull didn't need whatever money would come from Donald's death. Dorothy Harkness, on the other hand, would gain what to her would be plenty. Sure, nearly a million would go to Turnbull. But that would mean much less to him than the 50,000 insurance would to her. Well, there seemed to be nothing more to say to her at the moment, so I left her, took a cab back to the station. That's item five, sixty-five cents, and telephoned to the house on Birchbrook Road in the hope that Donald would be home and I'd have a chance to talk to him. Hello? Oh, Mr. Turnbull, uh, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, splendid. Where are you? Well, I'm at the station, but I was calling to try and... Splendid. Haskins will drive the car down to meet you immediately. Well, uh, now... I knew that if you thought it over, you'd be willing to take on this case. Uh, yeah, sure. You just wait right there. Haskins will be along in a few minutes. Goodbye. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Thank you, but before we, uh, before we talk about this... Sit thing... down, won't you? Now, from what I've been able to learn, Donald is planning to leave for Egypt immediately. I, uh, checked with a friend at the Explorers Club in New York where the boy's been staying these past few days. Oh, I thought he always stayed right here with you. Well, he does, except when he's preparing for an expedition. Then you are going to let him go. Well, how can I stop him without making him look foolish in the eyes of his colleagues? The museum, the universities are so interested in his work. Yes, I have to let him go. What would you beside him then? Oh, wait a minute. Of course, I'll expect you to be with him during the entire expedition. Oh, well, now look, I... Remember this, no expense is to be spared in the protection of my nephew's life. I uh, had to go down to New York to see David Wilt. He's my stockbroker, Harris and Dillman Company. While I was there, I stopped at my bank and arranged to have some 5,000 in American Express Chavez checks ready for you. All you have to do is go down there and sign them, pick them up. If you need more, cable me. You don't waste any time, do you? I know Donald. He's very stubborn, and determined, and willful. <laughs> in his present frame of mind, he might pack up and take off at a moment's notice. I want to be sure you're at his side. Okay, you're the boss. But, Mr. Turnbull... Yes? You still haven't told me why you think his life is in any more danger on this expedition than on any of the others he's undertaken. Because that girl, Dorothy Harkness, is smart, is clever. 
Because of something that happened on Donald's last expedition, Yucatan. Oh? He didn't realize it until afterwards, but one of the men in his party, a man he'd selected himself, turned out to be a friend of this Dorothy Harkness. Not 20 minutes ago, I heard exactly... Now listen to me. This man caused a couple of accidents. At least they called them accidents. That could have cost Donald his life. And Mr. Dollar, though lacking any proof, I am convinced he was put up to them by the beneficiary of his insurance policy, Dorothy Harkness. Did I say somebody was lying? Somebody had to be lying. And by now, that old feeling was beginning to come back to me. That hunch, whatever it is, that told me somebody was planning to kill Donald. Eric Turnbull, Dorothy Harkness? Who? Something told me I'd better get to Donald Cronin. But fast. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, suddenly the reason for a carefully planned murder becomes crystal clear, and a race against death becomes a race for my own life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. (laughs) 